Christian tradition tells us that nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth came here to Jerusalem. He was among thousands of other Jewish pilgrims celebrating the holiday of Passover. The date was 30 AD, and Judea is under Roman occupation. According to the Gospels, Jesus comes to the temple, the holiest site in all of Judaism. He drives the cattle herders and the dove sellers out and overturns the tables of the money changers. There is a near riot, and the Jewish high priest, Caiaphas, has Jesus arrested and put on trial. Jesus is hastily convicted of inciting opposition to the Romans and turned over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who sends Jesus to the cross. Jesus is then tortured and begins his journey to the hill of Golgotha, where he's crucified. His final march is remembered in Christian tradition as the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. It's divided into the 14 stations of the cross. Today, thousands of Christian pilgrims arrive in Jerusalem. They walk along the route where it's believed that Jesus was tried, tortured, and then wore his cross to the place of crucifixion. These devoted Christians know that this path may not be historically accurate. For them, it's an act of faith. But is it possible that they are actually walking in the footsteps of Jesus? To find out if there's any archaeological proof behind the traditions, I meet with Professor Helen Bond in the old city of Jerusalem. Our first stop is where Jesus was held and judged by the Jewish high priest, Caiaphas. She takes me to a church, which according to some Christian traditions, is built where Caiaphas once lived. Since Caiaphas was also a judge, one would expect to find holding cells under his home. And indeed, that's precisely what archeologists have found here. Jesus could have been held right here the night he was arrested. This is a church of St. Peter the Cockcrow, or St. Peter Gallicantu. It's on the outskirts of Jerusalem, and it's one of the places where, according to some of the early traditions um, associated with some very early pilgrims to Jerusalem, that the, the place where Caiaphas lived might possibly have been. Caiaphas's palace might have been actually above this place. It's very difficult to know what to make of these traditions. You need to remember that Jerusalem itself underwent drastic changes between the time of Jesus and the third, fourth century when these pilgrims are coming along. Jerusalem was flattened once in the Jewish revolt against Rome in AD 70, and then it was completely obliterated in 135 in the second war against Hadrian this time. So it's difficult to know exactly how far people kept any sense of continuity. So it seems that this dungeon may very well be where Jesus was held and interrogated. But if Jerusalem was destroyed and then rebuilt after Jesus' crucifixion, what does that say about the other traditional stations of the cross? Are they really located where Jesus spent his final hours, from incarceration to crucifixion? Is it even possible to know for certain where those places are? I go now with Professor Bond to the traditional first station, the Praetorium, where Jesus was displayed on a stage before a crowd and condemned to death by the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Today, pilgrims believe that this happened in the area of the Antonia Fortress, once a massive Roman fort that was built about 50 years before Jesus' crucifixion. In a local gift shop, we find the bedrock foundations beneath the remains of the fortress. So is this the actual place where Jesus was condemned, 
The Gospels don't say Antonia Fortress, do they? No, they don't specify where it is. They just say the governor's praetorium or the headquarters. And the reason why um, traditionally the first station of the cross has been at the Antonia is that people used to think that the Antonia was the likeliest place for the praetorium. Um, recently, scholarly opinion has changed. So if the trial of Jesus did not happen at the Antonia Fortress, where did it happen? Professor Bond and other scholars believe that the most suitable candidate would be Herod's palace. Built just a few years before the birth of Jesus, this would have been one of the most significant buildings in Judea of the time. And Professor Bond believes this is exactly why Pontius Pilate would have preferred to stay here when visiting Jerusalem. We're just outside the city walls here, and well, the bottom row here are the, probably the remains of um, Herod's palace. This is the home that Herod the Great built for himself. I mean, it's a luxurious palace. It's a beautiful place, you know, all mod cons, the best place in Jerusalem. And so, of course, you know, where's Pilate going to come? He's going to come and stay in Herod's former palace. Helen tells me that the raised area behind us may very well have been the actual platform where Jesus was condemned. So we're talking here. Yes, that's the one right up there. And what would have happened here? Well, that was where Pilate brought Jesus out, um, showed him after the scourging, according to John's gospel, and brought him out to the, the crowd of people and said, Eke homo, behold the man. And he says to the- Wait, wait a minute, I may be standing exactly where Jesus stood? Possibly, yeah, possibly right there. It's the, the raised platform where a judge would go to pronounce judgment, and quite often there would be a judgment seat on it. Now, what amazes me is that people, pilgrims, go to the Via Dolorosa, and here you have actual archaeology that fits with the narrative, and nobody knows about it. So what does this say about the rest of the stations? Are there more mysteries to solve? The fifth station of the cross marks the spot where Simon of Cyrene held Jesus with his burden. It is here that there was a moment both historic and intimate between Jesus and Simon. According to the Gospels, Jesus stumbled en route to the crucifixion and Simon, who was visiting Jerusalem from Cyrene, helped him carry his burden. Simon and his son Alexander became early followers of Jesus. Incredibly, experts agree that their physical remains have been found in a limestone bone box known as an ossuary. Strangely, it sits ignored under an archival shelf in the back of a university building. Well, we have a, a nice ossuary that was found in 1941. One of the inscriptions clearly says Simonos. And apparently the chalk, which is on the other side and is essentially faded, does have the two names, Alexander at the top, Simon below, which would indicate that both of these individuals were put in this ossuary. On the lid of this ossuary, the place named Cyrene in modern Libya is inscribed. Simon of Cyrene is mentioned in the New Testament helping Jesus with his carry his cross. If scholars have generally agreed this is his bone box, this is it, then this is one of the most important artifacts in Christendom. Why is it sitting under somebody's table? Part of it is that it was found many years ago in 1941. That was long before there were even popular magazines on biblical archaeology for the layman. So it escaped the popular attention. You have to have a publicist. You have to have somebody that says, boy, this is something. Let's put this out, right? Yeah, uh, so it ends up sitting in a storeroom. It ends up sitting in a storeroom. And it seems that the biggest controversy surrounds the last Stations of the Cross, where Christians believe Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected. According to Catholic tradition, the two holiest sites in all of Christendom are inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. 
built in the fourth century by the first ever Christianized Roman Emperor, Constantine, this church replaced a pagan temple once dedicated to the love goddess Aphrodite. Legend has it that at the site of construction, Constantine's mother, Helena, rediscovered the actual cross Jesus was crucified on, strengthening the theory that this is the site of the crucifixion and the tomb. Protestants disagree. They congregate at the garden tomb, which is another candidate for the spot of crucifixion and the tomb. The garden tomb was what we bought. It was unearthed in 1867. According to the Gospels, Jesus was crucified on a hill called Golgotha, which means Skull Hill in Aramaic. Because of its proximity to a hill that fits that description, some scholars began to think that the garden tomb might be the real final station of the cross. Where is Skull Hill? Right over here behind me are two caves in the rock. And between them, there's like a bridge of a nose sticking out. It looks something like a skull face. The Gospels also say that Jesus was crucified outside the city wall. And the garden tomb fits that description as well. Unlike the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is located deep inside the old city of Jerusalem. The Romans never, ever crucified people inside the city. There's a quote in the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 12, says, he died outside a city gate. Now, unfortunately, the writer doesn't tell us which gate, but just around the corner of that building there is a very large gate. It's called Damascus Gate, and it's the main entry and exit point for the northern half of the city of Jerusalem. We know from the excavations beneath it that there was a gate on that site 2,000 years ago. So putting the three things together, the ancient gate, the old walls, and a place of a skull. And this site seems to match the Bible's description of the place where Jesus died. There is now another location, a third candidate for the place of crucifixion and burial. In 1980, a first century tomb was discovered during construction in the southern end of modern Jerusalem. This 2,000-year-old family burial cave contained 10 limestone coffins, ossuaries. Six out of the 10 had inscriptions. On five of these ossuaries were engraved the names of many of Jesus' family members, including one with the name Jesus, son of Joseph. Many scholars believe that the cluster of names is coincidental and that another first century man with the name Jesus was buried here. Others disagree. Could this tomb, now sealed in a garden in a modern Jerusalem neighborhood, be the actual final resting place of Jesus of Nazareth? Whatever the truth may be, at Easter, pilgrims have begun to leave flowers at this new site. At the end of the day, for all these Jerusalem pilgrims, the actual locations seem to be less important than the spiritual journey that they are on.